get up, get, get up, get up. What's up, Mets fans? Welcome back to the Mets Up Podcast. Today, we're going to have something fun for you here, a little bit different. We're going to be doing a Mets draft of all-time Mets seasons. So the way that this is going to work is that me, James, and John, we're going to be each drafting our own team, starting lineups, a couple pitchers, some relievers, and we're going to be using the best singular seasons of players. So if Mike Piazza 2000 gets taken, you can do Mike Piazza 2001. You can double up on a player, just cannot double up on that player's season for your team. It's really simple. You'll get it. It's a snake draft. It'll make more sense as we go. We've done a couple of these before. Excited to do this one because this one's just a bit of research that went into this one. Yeah, it's also a good way to highlight some of the best seasons in Mets history because a lot of these guys come and go, but you just kind of forget that there was that one incredible season that was put together. No, 100%. So, I mean, how do we want to start this? Who do, you, who do we want to go first? I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I think Vito should pick. Yeah, Vito, pick, pick who's going first, second, and third here. We're going to leave it to an unbiased individual. I feel like John is John, so John can go last. Nice. <laughs> and I'm going to go James first. All right. Okay, wow. So Me first? James, Mark, John, and then we snake it back. So, okay. James, a lot of pressure here with the first overall pick. I, in a way, yes. I like a Part of me wanted to go, like, in terms of, like, you know, find the value here. But I really think I'm just, like, not going to think that hard about this and just go to the, the best season in Mets history. It's the new Mets now. We don't have to find the value as much. Yeah, right. There's no more, no more value. Now we're, just, now we're just playing to win. And I, what I think is the best season in Mets history was absolutely David Wright in 2007. Yeah, it's a good one. I really just think this was the one right here. David Wright, 2007, he was – he really should have been the MVP – other things that happened that made him not win the MVP. Jimmy Rollins won it with like almost two and a half less war, which is a crime against humanity. It's keeping Jimmy Rollins on Hall of Fame ballots for no good reason, even past that. David Wright played 160 games, hit 30 homers, drove in 100, stole 30 bases, very sneaky 30-30. Now, there have not been that many 30-30 seasons in Mets history. David Wright has one of them. 325, 416, 546 slash, 150, w, um, 150 OPS plus. Even, he even turned in 42 doubles, 196 hits. It was an unbelievable season by all accounts, and what I think is statistically the best season in team history. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good start. With great defense as well. Yeah, can't can't really blame that pick as the number one overall. I'm going to go a similar way of just these notable franchise players that had amazing years, and this is simply one of the best years a catcher's ever put up. You know me, I'm a big Mike Piazza guy. My first pick is going to be Piazza's 2000, and, yeah, no, 2000 season, where it was... 38 homers, 26 doubles, 113 RBIs. He had an OPS at over 1,000 for a catcher, finished third in the MVP voting that year. Obviously, the Mets made it to the World Series that season, 324 average. I mean, every way you looked at it, Mike Piazza was not just one of the best catchers in baseball, but he was simply one of the best players. And I got to pick my boy. Mike, if you're watching this, I don't know, maybe you're at the stadium. Number one pick for me. And I have the third pick. Thank you, Vito. Um, my pick here is going to be someone who I wish was a member of the 2000 Mets with Mike Piazza, and if he was, I believe the 2000 New York Mets are World Series champions, and that is none other than John Olrude yep. and his 1998 season when he had an on-base percentage Unreal. of 447, which is the best single-season mark in franchise history. John Olrude that year played all but two games consistently in the lineup. The best ability? Availability. availability. That is correct. A 163 OPS plus and a 551 slugging percentage. It was a travesty that John Olrude got away. Now, I know a lot of people say he wanted to go home to Seattle, and if that's the case, that's the case. But John Olrude is one of the forgotten great all-time Mets. It killed me to see him wear the pinstripes. But that 1998 <laughs> season helped me fall in love with baseball. John Olrude with the number three overall pick. I'll never forget the, the helmet in the field. It's such an iconic look. I know he yeah, had like the, the condition or whatever he did it for to keep his head mm -hmm. safe. But so that was Peter Check used to do that too. Yes. Well, yeah. he wore like a different helmet. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, John Olerud was such a stud. A very underrated, underappreciated player in the grand scheme of baseball. And underrecognized. John, you have another pick here. Come back on the snake. I do. And I am getting a steal here with the first pick of the second round. And that is going to be Howard Johnson's 1989 season. Yeah. Yep, that was a good this one. is a year that is semi-forgotten in Mets history. It Let's was after the 88 season, which was really their, the end of that, that dominant run that the Mets had. But Howard Johnson had a few incredible years. This 1989 season in particular, an OPS plus of 169, Eww. the best single season mark in the history of the franchise. You want to talk about a 30-30 season, he had 41 steals in this season and 36 home runs yeah. with 104 RBIs to boot. Howard Amazing. Johnson, pound for pound, 
was one of the best players in Mets history when you look at these kinds of seasons yeah. he had. 100%. So how could I not take him just sitting there for me? I maybe should have taken him third overall, but <laughs> yeah. I had the snake, so it's all good. Give me Hojo with this pick. Yeah, my, my Greek uncle will really appreciate that one. I can hear him right now saying, we need more players like Hojo, like <laughs> in the thick Greek accent. Uh, for my pick here in the second round, oh, man, I'm really stuck between a couple different places that I want to go, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump the gun a little bit here, maybe. I don't know. It's going to be a bold pick. I'm just thinking about uh, you know value here and the depth at this position. And I'm going to go to second base here for this second round pick. And I'm going to go with 2019 Jeff McNeil. Interesting. And the reason I go with 2019 Jeff McNeil. Wow. Fr friend of the program. Got a lot friend, of the bone for my Friend pick. of the program. So, you know, <laughs> Jeff McNeil there. I know, I know Eduardo Alfonso and guys were available. But Jeff, that season really had quite an unbelievable year. 23 homers, 38 doubles, 75 RBIs, 318 average, 384 on base, 531 slugging, 916 OPS. It's a phenomenal year. An OPS plus at 143. The second base position is pretty much him and Edgardo Alfonso. So I, I went with McNeil's best year. All right, well, it's a good pick. Homer pick. Mark picking his friend. Of course, Second yeah. base also was objectively probably the, the weakest position on the board here. For sure. In terms of history. I was looking at that too. But you, you got I'm, I'm my snake, I'm going to make two pretty incredible picks here. You guys just left these two on the bone. First of all, with the last pick of the second round, I'm going to take Carlos Beltran's 2006 season. That's a good one. Where he put... All the concerns of a very slow 2005 start to his Mets career to bed after signing the massive contract. Played 140 games, which isn't even like... like it's not even a full season. You, just, you, you missed a month. You, yeah, you left like three series on the board there. He had 41 home runs, stole 18 bags, 116 RBIs, 127 runs scored. Not even at a leadoff spot in the order. Really, Carlos Baltron was always the third hitter, as we remember. Of course. 275, 388. 594 slash for a 982 OPS, the highest of Beltron's career with, as we know, gold glove defense in center field. He was the catalyst, the lightning rod. He was the best player on a Mets team that was the best team in all of baseball. 100%. And I'll never forget the way he played that season. He got blazing hot towards the end. He was he was unbelievable. My next pick, we're going to start to get pitchers off the I board. knew you were going to be the first yeah, pitcher guy. I got to get a pitcher guy. We also decided before for the listeners at home, we're gonna, there's going to be five total pitchers in this team, three starters, two relievers, and there's literally, absolutely, there's no other way you can go in terms of a pitcher than just taking Doc Good in the 1985 season, as I pull the stats up right now. Doc Good in 1985, he had a season that not only was the best season ever pitched in the Mets history, it was probably one of the, the handful of best seasons ever pitched in Major League history, especially when you consider the modern era and just like modern offense that was happening towards the 80s. Through 276 innings, this was only his second year in the Major Leagues. He was only, what, 20 years old at the time? He was a baby. I believe he was 20. <laughs> 1.53 ERA, 16 complete games, Eight of which were shutouts, twenty-four wins and four losses. Where's the where's the strikeouts here? Two hundred sixty-eight strikeouts, which isn't even a lot considering our modern baseball in terms of two hundred seventy-six innings, yeah. which is pretty funny in its own right. Two one three FIP, zero nine six WHIP. He it was came in fourth in the MVP balloting as a pitcher. It was absolutely far and away the best season pitch in Mets history, and we, we commend Doc for that. See, it, it was, but I, I think this one's really, really close. I think this is the number two, or 1A, 1B. Yeah. And that's going to be Tom Seaver's 1971 year. He didn't win the Cy Young this season, but he was robbed because that's when the Cy Young was based on who had the most pitcher wins, which, as we know, is a relatively useless stat. I mean, Tom Seaver went 20-10 and 10 with a 176 ERA. That doesn't even make sense. How do you lose 10 games? When you give up less than two runs per nine innings, 176 ERA, the best in all of Major League Baseball, 289 strikeouts, the most in the National League, a whip at .946. I mean, everything that Tom Seaver did this year was disgusting. It's weird to say for Tom Seaver because obviously he has some Cy Young Award years, and weirdly enough, 71 isn't that Cy Young Award season, but it probably was the best season of his entire career. I'm going to take Tom Seaver as my number one ace. And I'm going to go with the pitcher also because I can't fall behind. Mm -hmm. And just for context, this is all historical. And whatever's happens in the past has happened in the past. <laughs> I have no choice but to go with 2018 Jacob DeGrom. Yeah. And if you want to talk about no run support, this is the story of no <laughs> run support. A 170 ERA over how many starts? Mm, over 32 starts that year. Just pure dominance from start to finish. I think we can all agree the best Mets season that we have seen in our lifetimes. Um, that was not a great Mets season, obviously. The team really, they did start 11-1. and one. It was all downhill from there. Yeah. And in a very lost season, every single time Jacob DeGrom took the ball that year, it was an event in itself. To the very last start he had against the Atlanta Braves, it was must-watch TV. It helped him get the new contract. He signed right before the 2019 season. Jacob DeGrom 
did things that I had never seen on a pitcher's mound before. And for that, how could I not go with Jacob DeGrom with my pick? Yep. Now I'm going to go offense for my next pick to kick off the next round, and that's going to be Daryl Strawberry's 1988 season. It's a good one. That's where I was going. I think it's been off slept upon here a little bit, but it's off the board now. Daryl Strawberry, look, he was drafted. He was a phenomenon. In 1988, he was an absolute force, leading the National League in home runs, a 9-11 OPS, which led the National League, and a 165 OPS plus that was also best in the National League, the second best in Mets history in a single season, behind only his teammate for this purpose, yeah. Howard Johnson. Daryl Strawberry, an all-time great Met. 1988, it's a shame. It's a travesty that team did not win the World Series. Damn you, Mike Socia. But <laughs> Daryl Strawberry, my pick. All right, so now to start off the fourth round for me, I, there's a lot of great options here, but I think I want to get Jacob deGrom on the board, just really solidify this rotation. I'm going to take Jacob deGrom's 2019 season, That's which was really also one. incredible. I mean, I hate to bang the drum again, but he's just I, really good. I sneaky think that season was better than the 2018 season. You? Just because of the ball that year and how insane everything else was in terms of baseball. Because 2018 season, we look back and we see that Offense was suppressed then anyway. Yeah. In 2019, he got pumped up amazingly, and he was just so far and away the best pitcher. But go on. No, no. I, you basically took the words out of my mouth. Thank you, you for stealing my pick. I'll well, take yours next. I was ready, I was ready to do it. So. <laughs> but DeGrom 19, yeah, that's going to be my number two. All right. This is a great pick. I, I really wanted that Jacob DeGrom. So now with that one, I just want to keep, you know, keep, keep setting the standard here, keep getting the best things I ever can, and I'm going to take – Edwin Diaz, 2022. It's a good one. To be, to be the stalwart in the back end of my bullpen. He, again, similar to a lot of the guys we said before, not only was this one of the best season in Mets history in terms of reliever, it could have been the best season in baseball history in terms of reliever. Yeah. In terms of strikeout rate, run suppression. I'm pulling up the stats right now just so we can remember them all. Now, we know this just happened, but we're excited. 50% K rate is just, like, silly. 50% strikeouts, only 7% walks. So that walk rate was hilariously his lowest since 2018. <laughs> <laughs> he said the new 43% strikeout minus walk rate, which no one's even even got close to sniffing that besides Jacob DeGrom. Yeah. <laughs> the slider, the fastball, even found a way to get 47% ground balls, or something I never thought I'd ever see Edwin Diaz do in my entire life. 0 .90 FIP, 1.3 ERA. I believe he... Did not blow a save. I don't know about that one. I'm, I'm, not, right I'm not sure sure if he didn't I'm blow sure a save did. or not. He yeah, did. he definitely yeah. did. No, but I think he blew some tie games. No, That's he still blew one in Arizona. I could, I could, yeah. April 22nd. Oh, you're right, this he year. blew three saves. Yeah, right? yeah. Blew three saves. Blew three saves. All right, take that, bring that one back in. But <laughs> it felt like he didn't blow any. Didn't, yeah, <laughs> maybe not after a while, but that that was the one. Edwin Diaz, 2022. I'm gonna have him in my bullpen, and now I'm gonna get another bat. John took that strawberry one who I wanted here. This this is gonna be a funny value pick here because we talked about how. How second base is a little bit weaker in terms of Mets history. I think I know where you're going. Castillo, give it to me. Ew. Oh, God <laughs> Gross. Eduardo Alfonso mm. in 2000. Was a really good year. Sneaky. That was one of the best offensive seasons in the history of the Mets franchise. Based on baseball reference, offensive war. The fifth most offensive war any player ever got a single season for the Mets. In that season, Eduardo Alfonso had 25 homers, 90 ribbies, 320, 425, 542 slash. 967 OPS, 150 OPS plus, came 15th in the MVP balloting, made the all-star team, played second base, 150 days out there. Great player, Garlo Alfonso. Another player is very underrated, Mets lore. Happy he got his roses two seasons ago. Mets Hall of Fame, but Garlo Alfonso, I mean, second baseman of my team. Now, Fonzie, Fonzie was a good ball player, for sure, no doubt. For me, I'm going to go with a historic season at the first base position. I'm going to go with Pete Alonso's 2019. Damn I mean, it. you just you can't <laughs> was, find a better rookie year among many players, you especially went, you in Mets history. base in the first round. Yeah, you couldn't. We we're going to put Pete. You're off the board. There's a DH in baseball. We're not now. doing DH. <laughs> we're not doing DH. This is old school. We get, we're bringing <laughs> back the old National League rules. But 53 homers, 30 doubles, 120 RBIs, a 941 OPS as a rookie, 24 year old. Pete Alonso at first base. I mean, it's the best offensive first base season maybe ever for the Mets. Yeah, possibly. John, I mean, you're up. Home runs. Well, if pitchers are hitting, then I'm going to go possibly off the board here. I'm taking. Johan Santana, Ooh. his first season with the Mets in 2008. Nice. The acquisition of Johan, for me, changed the way I viewed the Mets. It was an entire offseason of will we get him, will we won't. The Johan sweepstakes seemed to be never-ending until it was, until Omar Minaya landed the man. And boy, did he deliver in that first season. He threw 234 in the third innings. What do we say? The best ability is? Availability. availability. Johan went 16-7, and seven, led the National League in ERA, and on the last, or his last start, the second to last day of the season, he came through with a three-hit 
shut out with a torn meniscus. Now, the rest of the contract might not have worked out that well, minus, of course, June 1st, 2012, a night we'll never forget. But Johan Santana, that 2008 season, give me Johan. <laughs> and I have another pick, and I'm going back to offense here. And I am going with a name that you probably did not expect to hear for this purpose, but I'm going with Bernard Gilkey's oh, 1996 had season. On my list. I had it, John. I had it, I it John. It, it's such a good a season. Powerhouse. Bernard Gilkey, I believe this is the season that put him on the map for his Men in Black cameo. <laughs> <laughs> During the year, Gilkey, over 656 plate appearances, an OPS plus of 155, 30 homers, 73 walks, an on-base machine, a slug machine. He was a great, great player on, obviously. I mean, these are years. These were the very lean years in Mets, in Mets history, excuse yeah. me. It was him. It was Butch Husky. I don't believe Brian <laughs> McRae was quite there yet. Todd Butch Hunley Husky. was also hitting. Obviously, offense was up across baseball during these days. But Bernard Gilkey, one of the forgotten great seasons in Mets history. And I got him on my squad here. There you I go. like it. I like it. I know something that's, you know, been a topic of conversation for Mets fans the last few years has been a left-handed reliever. So I'm going to go to the bullpen, and I'm going to take a left-hander reliever. You guys have probably heard of him. His name's Billy Wagner. Guy should be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Billy deserves to be there. He's possibly the best left-hander reliever of all time. I'm going to take his 2006 season where he shockingly didn't make the All-Star game, but just proves that the All-Star game is a little bit of a, not necessarily the most truthful way to prove if someone's good or not. Wiffle gazy. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> Billy Wagner, 2.24 ERA in 72 innings that year, a whip at 1.1. Obviously, he had a little bit lower whips a little bit later on with the Mets, but in 72 innings, having that with 94 strikeouts, just one of the best relievers in the game, one of the best relievers that the Mets had. Put the guy in the hall. Give me the left-handed kid, Billy Wagner. Nice. So we're going to keep gonna stick with this same era of Mets baseball. I'm just using this to, to recreate my youth here. I might pick my shortstop, my eventual leadoff hitter, will be Jose Reyes, 2011 season. Yeah, that's the one. 2011 Jose that's Reyes season. This was the year, because when Jose Reyes came up, he was fantastic and he was so exciting, but he still didn't really have – like the maturity of a hitter that we always kind of hoped he would develop and the way he played when he was so young, just coming up so young, the big prospect he was. In 2011, something happened where it all just came together for Jose. And he got that batting average up to 337, won himself a batting title, even got the on-base percentage up to 384, which for Jose Reyes was just a massive, massive achievement at the time. He even slugged 500 that year. Jose Reyes had 16 triples, the fourth time in his career he would lead Major League Baseball in triples. On top of that, he had another 31 doubles, just seven homers, whatever. Stole 40, no, stole 39 bases, which for this time for Jose Reyes was not that many. But we know in terms of how modern baseball has gone, 39, 39 stolen bases, tons of stolen bases. He was an all-star that year. Again, he won the batting title, came 11th in the MVP voting, and that was all in only 126 games. Jose Reyes, 2011, was an unbelievable season in Mets history with the bat. Now my next pick, I got to think about this for a second, just going to ponder it. Who you didn't know. have it ready? No, I mean, I have it ready, but it's, I mean, it was between a few. But I'm going to take, take Gary Carter, 1985. All right. Gary Carter, the kid, 1985. I believe that was his first or second full first year. First year. First, first year. full year when he came to the Mets. It was – oh, I got to stop. I got to pull it up. This kid's <laughs> not prepared. I wasn't prepared. I was in between. First full year he came to the Mets, 30 homers from the catcher spot. Unbelievable. Significantly yeah. more walks than strikeouts, which is something you love. It. You guys know I love more than anything in the world. 281, 365, 488 slash. Fantastic season from the kid. Really, in a 1985 season that the Mets kind of put themselves on the map for being a solid team, didn't get there, lost that last series of the year to the Cardinals. They kind of showed everybody what they were about and what was going to happen in the next season. Yeah, the uh, the, I mean, Gary Carter, one of the best catchers of all time for sure. I'm going to... Kind of follow up here with your shortstop pick because I think it might be the, the the group that has the least amount of names that you can really throw out there. I'm going to take Lindor's 2022 season. Uh, it was just a great year overall as a player. I mean, defensively, we know Francisco is one of the best defensive shortstops that we have on this team, which includes a lot of great defensive shortstops in their history, but Lindor is definitely one of the best. 26 homers, 25 doubles, 5 triples, 107 RBIs, 16 stolen bases, 270 average, 125 OPS plus, finished ninth in the MVP voting. We've been waiting for Francisco Lindor. Here he is. That's my pick. Very similar to the Carlos Beltran 2006 season. Yes. Incredibly similar. John, what do you got? All right. Well, this one probably should have gone already. Um, I'm going to take him now, and it's Tom Seaver's 1973 season, a Cy Young Award year, obviously a year where the Mets, the, uh, the amazing Mets that year. Yep. You got to believe, I believe, was born that year. And Seaver was absolutely dominant that season. Um, a 208 ERA, led the National League, 
18 complete games. That's gross. In 36 starts. That's gross. Half of the starts were complete games. <laughs> really Doesn't make any sense. 290 innings pitched, 251 strikeouts, leads baseball, sub one ERA, a fifth just over two and a half, and an adjusted ERA of 175. This man was, I mean, look, we know he's the franchise for a reason. Yeah. We didn't get to see him. And it's exercises like this that you can really look back on Mets history and realize just how great some of these years were. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Doc Gooden, I think, is uh, universally respected as having the best single season pitching year in Mets history. This is probably number two, I think. Tom Seaver, 1973. Give me Mr. Seaver. With my next pick. He's having fun. <laughs> I. We're getting deep into it now. We are. Now, now it's going to get a little wonky. Yeah. We are getting deep. I will have some fun. Yes. I'm going to go with Pete Alonso's 2022 Damn it. season. Nice pick. Nice I pick. I wanted Pete Alonso's 2019 season for obvious reasons. He sets the Mets single season all-time home record, a home run record. Then he breaks the rookie home run record. So now are we going to have a DH on this team? Because you just took two first basemen? He can play anywhere. Pete's an where athlete. Where are you putting him? Yeah, where's he playing? Oh, so I can't take him? Well, I mean, I just want to know where you're going to lay the seam out. Yeah, you got to put him in a spot now. All right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have a DH? We can have a DH. We can have a DH. All but right. uh, Let's have a DH. There you go. Yeah, there I there think go. it's fair. I'm DH. taking him anyway. Just on merit alone. <laughs> Pete, <laughs> this season sets the Mets single season RBI record, leads the National League in RBIs with, 100, with, with 131, 40 homers, an OPS plus of 146. Amazing season. I feel like it's easy to forget just how dominant Pete Alonso was this year, but boy, oh boy, was he dominant. Uh, his second incredible year, second time he's hit 40 home runs, 40 plus home runs, I should say. And guess what? It's not going to be the last. So give me the 2022 Pete Alonso season. Many more to come for the polar bear. Mine's going to be a little weird because the sample's small. Sample's real small on this guy for this specific year. But 2015, Yoannis Cespedes. I mean, was there anything more electric <laughs> than when that guy stepped into New York at City Field and was just hitting bombs, crushing baseballs, leading us to the World Series that season? I know it didn't end with a World Series victory, but the Mets don't even come close to making the playoffs if Yoannis Cespedes is not a part of that team. In 57 games, 17 homers, 14 doubles, 44 RBIs, and 942 OPS. It was an unbelievable stretch. It was euphoric when he was here, and I think... While maybe it might not be the highest counting numbers, it's one of the most memorable Mets seasons ever. Yeah, it's a good pick. I mean, just in terms of what he did for the team that summer and just like a feeling around it, like it's crazy. It's just it's deadline acquisitions are so much fun. Yeah, you know, it's like that's no, nothing better than that. So John changed the rules and put the H's in here now. So we're gonna do another pick. I do want this historic Met, one of my favorite players of all time on my team, Mike Piazza. You, I believe, took the 99 season, correct? Took 2,000. You took 1,000, so I'm going to take 99. It's fair. Like, so Mike Piazza. It's a good year, good player. Yeah, right? Good year, good player. Lots of great years. And also, you know, DH, I think we're probably a little, little better home for him there. We get Gary Carter behind the plate. Yeah. We can let Mike just focus on mashing, like we saw him do with old-timers. They put a couple out, you know, into, into the stands. Mike Piazza in 1999, 40 home runs, career high. Missed that one. 124 RBIs, 9% walks, 12% strikeouts, 303 batting average, which is shockingly low for Mike Piazza during his prime, which is just... So unbelievable to think about how great this guy was. 361 on base, 575 slug. And then we don't even need him. We need to think about catching. No. We're just going to put him in the middle of that order and tell him to mash and mash all day long. But Mike Piazza, 1999, first full season with the Mets. That was the one. He even wasn't even like, he kind of got off to a bit of a slow start with the team, too. Yeah. Came out of nowhere there. Then my next pick, another double up, because it's going to go a different year than someone John picked. Dow Strawberry, 1987. Oh. Arguably, oh. arguably a better season than the famed 1988 season, because that year he was closer to winning the MVP. But 1987, 39 homers, 100 RBIs, 100 runs scored, 284, 398, 583 slug. Career high for Daryl Strawberry on base percentage that year. Almost got to, uh, to 400. Still came a sixth in the MVP balloting, really good, but just... An unbelievable season from Daryl Strawberry where he really just cemented himself as one of the elite power hitters in baseball. Yeah, that was a good pick. That was a good one. Well done on that. Tip the cap. Uh, that was a good pick. I'm going to go on the pitching side here, and I'm going to close off my starting pitching rotation here with a Cy Young Award winner by the name of R.A. Dickey, mm -hmm. the 2012 yeah. year. I mean, the fact that a knuckleballer who, whose career was kind of in limbo before he came to the Mets came here, won a Cy Young Award, completely revitalized his career as one of the cooler stories in all of baseball. 
to do with the knuckleball pitch that is kind of a lost art now. You just don't see it around as much as you did. Uh, R.A. Dickey is one of the most unique players to ever play. He threw a hard knuckleball, too, which you just, you never saw that. They always threw those floaty ones that kind of dance a little bit. R.A. came at you with like 75, 76 miles an hour on that knuckle, and he was filthy in 2012. 2.73 ERA with the knuckleball. 233 innings, 230 strikeouts, led the league. It, it was unbelievable. Five complete games, three shutouts. R.A. Dickey, number three for me. Well, I'm all about roster flexibility. I picked Howard Johnson earlier. <laughs> Howard Johnson played second, short, and third base. <laughs> so for the purpose of this game, he's my shortstop. And my third baseman is going to be 2008 David Wright. And now you said 07 David Wright, but David Wright in 2008 hit a career-high 33 home runs. David Wright that year was absolutely incredible. Um, obviously, the Mets moved out of Shea Stadium where his natural right center power swing was kind of taken away when we went to City Field with the gaping gaps in right center field. But that 2008 season for David Wright, for me, one of the best I've seen. So give me David Wright at third base. Now, I haven't taken a relief pitcher yet, but that's going to change. Ooh. And I'm going to go with the man who was on the mound for the final out in the NLCS and the World Series. This is three years earlier. It's Jesse Orozco's 1983 mm. season. Now, for all pitchers with a, at least 100 innings pitch in Mets history, he had an adjusted ERA of 248, and that is Pretty second good. to nobody in New York Mets history. This man allowed 18 earned runs over 110 innings of work. Jesse Orozco, it was almost foreshadowing that he was so damn dominant, and what a career he had. Played into his mid-40s, unbelievable. I remember Jesse Orozco as a kid. That's how long this guy played. That is kind of crazy. That is. So I am going with Jesse Orozco as my first relief pitcher. Okay. All right. Uh, since we do have the DH open, I'm going to go ahead and take my option here. I'm going to take Carlos Delgado's 2006 season, mm, that's which a good was one. That's a, good one. It's a good one. Carlos Delgado should be in the Hall of Fame as well. It's crazy he didn't stay put on, him on the, the ballot. ballot. Yeah, he put him back on. He was unbelievable. One of the most underappreciated power hitters of the time. Just doesn't get the love. 473 home runs in his career. But that year with the Mets in his first season, coming into a team that had some expectations here. 38 homers, 30 doubles, 114 RBIs, 909 OPS. OPS plus at 131. He got MVP votes delgado was the man that's a good pick i i'm gonna use this opportunity at the end of my snake here to round out my starting rotation and one of these picks is definitely gonna hurt everybody a lot but it's kind of something you gotta do Again, i think i know it like john said before we gotta remember everything in terms of history in terms of context in terms of where we were how we were feeling what we were doing at the time this happened and i think we can all agree that one of the greatest seasons that we ever ever any of us saw pitched by a met was was Matthew Harvey in 2013. Yeah. He, he, he got 180 innings. He only won nine games, which is very – would really make you realize the context of how bad that 2013 Mets team was. 227 ERA, 200 FIP. He was getting ground balls at 50% rate, striking guys out, 10 per nine innings. It was – every single time Matt Harvey stepped on the mound in 2013, it was an event. You wanted to go to the game. You wanted to watch it on TV. You think maybe this could be the time. There's a no-hitter. This – it, it, it was an event. He was the dark knight. It was every single thing he did was must-watch television. And everything that's happened with Matt Harvey sucks, but it, it's hard. you got to appreciate what he did that season. 100%. In terms of what, what we've seen as Mets fans. He was phenomenal. Yeah. Now, my next pick, something very different. I just, I just want to have a share of Tom Seaver. You guys each have receivers. <laughs> and, like, every single year was so good. I'm just going to pick one that was fun. Buying stock. Yeah. <laughs> and there, there were so many great Tom Seaver seasons mixed in. But I, I really, for some reason, I just... This 1975 season, the year he turned 30, the Mets team was really going downhill fast. He wouldn't spend that much longer with the Mets after this. Tom Seaver threw 280 innings this season, won 22 games, eight war in terms of <laughs> fan graphs is F war. And that's even, that takes you down because in the old days, he didn't get that many strikeouts. On top of that, Seaver turned in, I want to find the complete games here, 15 complete games with five shutouts. And that was 15 complete games in only 36 starts. So Tom Seaver, 1975. We got our innings either over here. Just, you know, <laughs> pack it all in there. Nice, nice three-man rotation to go through the season. So I'm going to have a, a little bit of a fun one here. I'm going to throw it back to way before I was on this planet. A man by the name of Cleon Jones. I'm going to take his 1969 season. Now, while he didn't put up the crazy home run numbers like you'd expect, you hear 151 OPS plus for a guy who played in 137 games. The offensive output was phenomenal that season from Cleon. 12 homers, 25 doubles, 4 triples, 75 RBIs, 16 stolen bases, walked 4 more times than he struck out, 340 average, 422 on base, MVP votes. Obviously, the Mets win the World Series that year. Cleon was a major, major part in it. Got to stick him in my outfield. I'm going to go with two guys from the 96 Mets for my snake. That'll give me three guys from the 96 Mets. A team that finished somehow 71 and 91. I'm not <laughs> entirely sure how. Love that 96 year. I do. 
That was year my, we were born. He knew. You too. Yeah, my, first one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my first one's going to be Todd Hundley, who had 41 home runs that season. It's unbelievable. A record that stood for a while until Carlos Beltran tied in 06, and then obviously Pete Alonso demolished it in his 2019 season. My other one, to round out my outfield, is going to be Lance Johnson. Oh, that's where I was going next. Who, believe it or not, at a 7.2 war overall, which, according to baseball reference, is the fifth best in a single season in Mets history. To go on. 21 triples that season. How many stolen bases did he have? Where are stolen bases on this? I feel like it was, I feel like, it was like 30-ish. Must have been. Yeah, I'm not sure where it is here. <laughs> but anyway, a spark plug atop my lineup. I've got my leadoff man. I wanted Jose Reyes. Didn't get Jose Reyes. So I've got Lance Johnson, Bernard Gilkey, and Todd Hunley representing the 96 New York Mets. John, John really knows they get the people excited. Yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing like talking about a fourth place team. Yeah. <laughs> it's so in depth. I'm going to close out my outfield here right now, uh, to finish up here, and it's going to be Kevin McReynolds from 1988. <laughs> I had him Kevin McReynolds, sneaky, had a really, really good year. And again, you, you hear about all the stars that were on these Mets teams during those late 80s, and Kevin McReynolds is always, always talked about, but I feel like doesn't get as much love as some of the other guys on this team. If you look at the year he put up in 88, 27 homers, 30 doubles, 99 RBI, stealing 20 bags as well, 288 average, 336 on base, 832 OPS, OPS plus at 142, finished third in the MVP voting. That's an unreal year for Kevin McReynolds. Uh, definitely going to be my third outfielder. All right. I'm going to make two picks here. One is going to be incredibly serious, and one's going to be a little bit stupid. Okay. But, you know, every, you need every, every baseball team needs a lot of different things to become successful. You need players who are for power. You need players who get contact. You need guys who are fast. You guys who run the base as well. Sometimes those guys aren't necessarily fast. I'm going nowhere with this. You need different kinds of pitchers. You want power pitchers. You want some fastballers. You want some sinker ballers. You know what else you want? As Mets fans know right now, you really want a left-handed reliever. <laughs> and there's no, there's, no, <laughs> there's no more quintessential Mets-handed reliever in Mets history than Mr. Pedro Feliciano. Yes. My God, Pedro Feliciano in a three-year stretch from I think it was 2008 to 2000. No, when was it? It was, two, <laughs> it was 2008 to 2010. He appeared in 86, 88, 92 games. That what is, year are you picking? I'm, I'm, the year I'm going to pick specifically is going to be 2009. That was the year he kind of married all of the, like, the, between the usage, the earned run average, the strikeouts, put it all together. Pedro Feliciano walked out of the bullpen almost every single day for the Mets that year. <laughs> we can't fish him more than half of our games. He had an ERA just at three. He was striking out a guy per inning. He wasn't walking anybody. He was getting 57% ground balls. Pedro Feliciano, 2009. Help keep the Mets organization afloat. And that's my pick. I like it. I like it. Was that your second pick or are you still? No, the first pick. Okay, Next okay. pick, we're just going to go classic. We need the first baseman over here. Yeah. You guys took all the fun Alonzo years. We're taking Keith Hernandez. Yeah. His first full year with the club, 1984, was just phenomenal. 15 homers, but he had 311 batting average, 410 on base, 450 slug, more walks and strikeouts. You guys know I love. Just the best defense at first base that was probably ever played. Yep. Also, in that year specifically, Keith Hernandez is my pick there. I need to fill in third base. That was a position I completely forgot existed. I just saw that I have it. And luckily, you guys didn't take my dude at third base. 1999, Robin Ventura. Mm, on the list. Great Another value. Great unbelievable value. year that doesn't get talked about enough. It was, I think, by far the best year of Robin Ventura's career, which was really nice to see. 32 homers, 38 doubles, 120 RBIs, played in basically every single game. 301 average, 379 on base, 529 slugging, 908 OPS for an OPS plus at 130. He was phenomenal that year. Always touted for having a good glove, but that year in particular, the bat came alive as well. Got sixth in the MVP voting in the National League. Uh, part of that, you know, early 2000s, late 90s Mets teams that started to come up and win some games, and Ventura was a stud. So we've got two picks left here, yep. and they both belong to me. So I have one reliever, and I need to uh, fill in my second. We each have one pick left. Got you, right. I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm taking off, I'm picking off the, the end of the, the last round, the beginning of the last round. <laughs> so two picks here to fill out my team. My relief pitcher is going to be, and I don't care what anyone says about this, it's going to be 2006, oh. Duaner Sanchez. Oh, oh he was good so good. One. Really good pick. He was and so good. He didn't complete the season, as we all know, and no one knows what would have happened if he did, but he was downright dominant in ERA sick. around 2-5, before, obviously, the fateful cab ride in Miami, <laughs> so on and so forth. I guess you could say if it doesn't happen, we never get the electricity of Oliver Perez at Chase Stadium, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> Don't get so me started. there's that. My second baseman, it's not going to be based on the regular season at all. It's going to oh, be based on the playoffs, and I'm going pick. with 2015 Daniel f***ing Murphy. Good job. He put John. the team on his back. Sorry, Vito. <laughs> He How many times are you going to do it? <laughs> it was your idea to make this for a rain delay. What are you doing? <laughs> He's like, we don't, get it. We don't care. <laughs> Leave it to him. I might, that might be the pick of the draft. Great I'm not going to lie. It very well might be because yeah. when push comes to shove, 
The man put the team on his back yeah. and took them to the World Series. It was Cespedes to get him to win the division in 2015, good. the regular season. And it was Daniel freaking Murphy in the playoffs with the home run streak, obviously, one after the next. He only had 14 home runs in the regular season that year. And then, obviously, turns out to be it wasn't a fluke. Daniel Murphy, great to see him at Old Timers Day. Hope to see him around here more. My last pick. Can't go wrong. Shipped up to Boston. John, that was that, that might have been the pick of the draft. Yeah, was that was one. a really good one. I didn't even consider. Is it fair, though? I mean, like, when you look at stats and you look at people, like, you don't count postseason records. So I feel like that's not fair. That's up for, that's up for the no, Mets. I'm still taking them. No, I'm yeah. still taking them. It still doesn't count pick. towards career total. Back that's the ball skills, Vito, and the man had it. The Mets fans it's can true. decide on this. Yeah, they can I, let us know if they, like the what they think about that. I, I respect the play. And yeah. I feel like if the conglomerate here respects yeah, yeah. the play, we gotta we got to honor that. My last pick is going to be a reliever. It's going to be a closer. It's going to be 2015 Jerry's Familia. Familia, mm-hmm. granted, in 2016 got more saves, but he was arguably unhittable in 2015. He was ridiculously good. Mets don't make the playoffs, don't make the World Series without him. The dude was lights out. 78 innings, a 1.85 year array with a whip at one for a guy who usually walks a lot of dudes. He had a two walk per nine that year while also bumping up the strikeouts. That was kind of his breakout season where you're like, oh, one of the best closers in baseball. Uh, Jerry's Familia is one of my favorite closers in Mets history. i to wrap this up here. Mr. Irrelevant, but hardly that. This is going to be a very funny pick. This one's all for the memes. You guys appreciate this. My last outfielder, the last pick. I know who it is. Bobby Bonilla. Bonilla. Yeah. <laughs> Bobby Bonilla, as much of a meme and a joke he's become in Mets lore and even baseball, sports media in general. Bobby Bonilla in 1993 at 34 homers, the 270 average. 130 WRC plus it was a very good year. I'm gonna take that because we have a lot of we have a lot of superstars in this team. We'll take we'll take Bonilla for the memes for the jokes, and we'll send you guys off like that for the se- draft of the best Mets seasons in team history. So Mets fans, let us know wherever you're watching this who you think won. You can tweet at us. You can comment on the YouTube channel at Mets Stuff. You'll be able to find us. Let us know who you think had the best team, and uh, we're excited to see your guys' replies. Thank you so much for watching, listening this all-time Mets season draft, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Mets Stuff podcast. Peace out. Peace out. See you next time. Get up. Get, get up. Get up.